History is full of amazing stories and memorable people. But we don't care about them. No hits, deep tracks only. Some of the most influential people in the world have been completely overlooked or just plain forgotten. We are digging deep into the history books to bring you their stories. And maybe some laughs along the way. This is History's B-Side. Today's B-Sider is The Man Who Did Not Walk on the Moon. Matt, I assume that you, like myself and a lot of us, were a child at some point. (laughs) Nope. I I was born 17. Okay. (laughs) I could already drive. So when you were a child... (laughs) Did you ever have aspirations? Like, what what did you want to be when you grew up? Ah, oh, man. I, in in trying to answer this, I have like a an existential breakdown because it's kind of like me choosing a college major, where I feel like as a child, I would, I was just in the mood to be whatever I was doing or playing with at the time. So, like, well, yeah, you're a child. With construction stuff. Yeah, I mean, you're not. I think like I, I wanted to be a lot of things. Twenty something year old but... Matt having an existential <laughs> breakdown about your career choices. This is little kid Matt. What do you want to do when you grow up? Or what yeah, did I mean, you I, want to I do? I wanted to be. I wanted to be a construction worker. I wanted to be a fireman. Um, I wanted to be Batman for sure for a <laughs> lot of years. Something you'll find funny is that for an entire year, the only year that I played baseball or little league, I decided I was going to be a professional baseball player, (laughs) which of course did not come to fruition. I remember when I was in like kindergarten or first grade, this might still be in my parents' basement, but we had to fill out this like poster about our interests and stuff at that age. And one of the boxes was like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And everyone would just put one answer, but being the indecisive kid that I was and still am, I had to put four different (laughs) things because it's like the typical kid (laughs) stuff, like police officer, firefighter, uh, teacher, and I think professional baseball player was the the fun one, I guess. One of them. Clearly none of those panned out. In 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 a weird twist of things, I guess. In eighth grade, we had like a vocational day and we all had to dress up and wear like a a dress shirt and tie. And I decided that day I wanted to be a lawyer, which I I dropped for like the next 15 (laughs) years until present day. But the reason I wanted to is because as an eighth grader, I enjoyed wearing a tie because it made me feel impressive so much. And the only guy the entire day that talked to us about their careers who had a tie on was a lawyer. And I went home and told my parents that I wanted to be a lawyer so I could wear a tie to work. And this was the birth of the soon to win best dressed Boardman High School class of 2011. Matthew Molito. Got a rep. <laughs> As a kid, did you ever want to be an astronaut when you grew up? I'm sure at some point. I mean, I I was an astronaut for at least two years of Halloweens, so I'm sure that crossed my mind. I feel like that's a common one for kids. I think just yeah, in general, Americans, especially kids, little boys, have this fascination with outer space. I love outer space. I mean, for us, we were the Toy Story generation, so we had like Buzz Lightyear that we That's true. aspired to be or play with or whatever because he was in our favorite movie when we were kids. Have you watched Cosmos? No, I haven't. With Neil deGrasse Tyson. It's really good. Neil deGrasse Tyson narrates it. It's like a, I don't want to say a spinoff, but it's a modern day version of Carl Sagan's um, older show. And I mean, it's basically just about space, but it's super cool and Hmm. honestly kind of trippy at times just to learn about how much is out there and and how much we can discover and and research with our limited resources. I'll have to look at that. See, I've always found space interesting. I definitely don't know that much about it, and I never wanted to be an astronaut, I guess. But anytime something in the topic of space, uh, whether we're studying planets or anything like that. It's just always interesting to like hear and read about. And I was just reading something today because as we're recording this only in the last couple of days, the 
Mars rover Perseverance just landed on the surface mm-hmm. of Mars. And it, I, I, yeah, that's right. I realize I keep picking these topics that are like relevant to something that just happened in the news, just completely coincidence. <laughs> but yeah. it works out, I guess. Not that anyone's going to hear this for <laughs> however long. But just anytime something in space comes up or we're in an environment where we can learn about something in space, I've always found it to be really interesting and catches our attention at the very least. Yeah. Like a year and a half ago, I was in Chicago for Rita had a work thing. And um, so I just had some free time and I went to the Adler Planetarium that was there. And the whole museum part of it was all this space exploration and all the details about all the different missions that they went Mm on throughout the late 50s and throughout the 60s and early 70s. Yeah. And then even as far back as I think when I was late teens, my family took a vacation to Florida and we went to visit the Kennedy Space Center. And that was really cool to see some of like the the old equipment and some of the old rocket ships and things like that. And kind of scary to look at that and think that this stuff was built in the 60s and actually yeah. took people to space. <laughs> like, yeah, there aren't cars That's today I... <laughs> from the 60s that, I mean, there are cars today from the 60s, but they're not like ones that you would drive your family around town and let alone go to the moon. Right. Well, I was in the course of kind of reviewing for this episode, I watched a couple uh, simulations on YouTube of the Apollo 11 landing just to kind of understand the mechanics. And it's just insane to me that they had, I mean, the sixties era technology could do some of that stuff. I mean, it it just seems kind of out of this world. And interestingly enough, literally the things I came yeah, well, yeah. But one of the things I came across when I was looking up uh, information for the quiz later on, and obviously this isn't a quiz question, but the navigation processor in the the Apollo 11 command module was no more complex than a pocket calculator. And even <laughs> they even made the statement that some modern day toasters that can like sense when your toast is done are more complex from a programming standpoint which is crazy like yeah. we have toasters now that are more complicated than the navigational processor on the apollo 11 just capsule, makes the so. whole thing more amazing that it Ooh. even happened yeah so speaking of apollo 11 and the kennedy space center is actually where apollo 11 launched from that's going to be sort of the subject of today's episode we're talking about the the mission that first landed humans on the moon and the people involved with that the Apollo 11 mission was a part of the Apollo program, which was NASA's third human spaceflight program following their Project Mercury and Project Gemini. The program originally was conceived by President Eisenhower amid the burgeoning space race between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. And it really kind of built upon what was established through the first two projects. This one, rather than being a single astronaut space flight, uh, throughout the Earth's orbit, it started to actually take multiple astronauts into space and eventually get them mm-hmm. to circumnavigate the moon and with the goal of potentially landing humans on the moon. When President Kennedy campaigned for office and eventually won election in 1960, he really put space flight as a priority for U.S. policy. On May 25th, 1961, JFK gave a speech where he set it as a goal for NASA to eventually land men on the moon and return safely back to Earth. He said, Hmm. quote, Now it is time to take longer strides, time for a great new American enterprise, time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out, of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important in the long-range exploration of space, and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. JFK then increased NASA's budget and committed to landing men on the moon before the end of the 1960s. So he mentioned the the mission being expensive, do you know what the the forecasted or the actual cost of the moon landing was? Well, the Apollo program in total, which was 17 plus missions between manned and unmanned space flights, 
cost around $25.4 billion, and that was $1973. So adjusted for today, the entire project cost $156 billion. Wow. It was a big investment. So let's talk about some of the equipment, some of the actual ships that they flew on. These ships were broken down into essentially three parts, really four when they were aimed at actually landing on the moon. The first part of the spacecraft was called the command module, and all these are abbreviated, so we'll use the abbreviations throughout the episode just so we're not getting too wordy here, but the command module, or the CM, is a cone-shaped cabin that the crew actually sat inside. It was covered in heat shields and loaded with parachutes, which would eventually slow the descent once they achieved their splashdown returning back to Earth. All three astronauts would be able to fit inside the command module, not too spacious, mind you, but they did fit inside the the command module, and this would be the one piece that would actually re-enter into Earth's orbit and land in the ocean. I'm interested to know, you might know the answer to this, but it's okay if you don't. Do you know how the heat shields work? Because I've always been curious about that. Uh, (laughs) I read about it as I was preparing for this, but not enough to, like, explain to you in a scientific way. (laughs) That's okay. Well, I can look it up. It's a pretty complex process. I'm sure it is. (laughs) Connected to the command module is what's called the service module, which is abbreviated just SM. And this is just a cylindrical attachment behind the command module. And it contained equipment for propellants and long distance communications. And this would actually be discarded right before re-entry into Earth's orbit. This is the piece that would really actually launch through space once you got outside of Earth's atmospheric pole. The command module and the service module would combine and be called the CSM. So it basically just as one piece, because this is what you would really view as like the the actual ship that sails through space, so to say. Now that extra piece that was added on for these moon-bound missions is called the lunar module. And this is a very, very stripped down, lightweight detachment that would actually sit inside what we'll talk about is called the launch vehicle. And it was only designed to descend and ascend just those two purposes it couldn't actually really steer or fly too much on its own but it had this descent stage and an ascent stage and it really only had enough fuel to sit on the moon for 34 hours or less future missions they would build a little more durable longer lasting ones that could sit on the moon for a couple days but for the apollo 11 mission that we're talking about they could only be on the moon for 34 hours or less or they would run Mm -hmm. out of fuel and be in some big trouble (laughs) The last piece of these spacecrafts is what's called the launch vehicle. And this is when you think about a rocket ship. This is the rocket part of the rocket ship. It's huge, and it's what really pushes the CSM into space. Apollo 11 used what was called the Saturn V, and it was 33 feet in diameter and 360 feet high. Now, the launch vehicle would actually launch the vehicle up into Earth's atmosphere propel it around through the Earth's orbit a few times, and then launch it out into actual space towards the moon. Yeah. Do you know what... So the service module and the launch vehicle were disposed of or detached. Did they fall back to Earth or float out into space? They sort of just became space debris. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Once once they're discarded outside of Earth's atmospheric pole, they kind of just float off into, <laughs> into space okay. and hopefully never really seen again. Yeah, I was interested. I've, I was always kind of curious to know that because I always imagined like this giant piece of Saturn V just like landing on a street somewhere <laughs> in a neighborhood. <laughs> I mean, it, I guess it's technically within the sun's gravitational pull. So it's still kind of like Interesting. is within orbit in some sense, but it's really just not really floating with any purpose or doing anything. It's just kind of like space trash. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> space junk. Right. Some of the notable missions of the Apollo program, uh, they started out with a few unmanned test missions, which helped them to examine the fuel and the equipment necessities once they got into orbit and being able to re-enter back into Earth's atmosphere. The first attempted manned mission was called Apollo 1, which took place in early 1967, or was scheduled to take place in early 1967, when unfortunately all three of the crew members died in a launch pad test less than a month before the scheduled takeoff. Wow. 
did this have i mean i assume a disaster like this had some sort of effect on the timeline of their missions or or especially public opinion about the the program it was definitely a setback led to some different government inquiries and investigations to figure out what happened and if it's worth pursuing this avenue but in a way it's just kind of the astronauts were very well aware of the risks that they were taking and this was yeah. just some faulty equipment that led to a fire in the cabin as they were testing out the launch capabilities so in a way they kind of inspired them to continue with the Apollo program because they didn't want these astronauts to have sacrificed their lives in vain. It, yeah. The astronauts, they were all committed to achieving this goal of putting a man on the moon and to see some of their colleagues die in that process, it would have been wasteful for them to just give up on the program. Right. I actually, this is certainly not as serious of a, of a disaster because generally they're not using manned craft, but it reminds me of a week or two ago, I was listening to Joe Rogan's podcast, his episode where he interviews Elon Musk about his space program. Mm -hmm. And he actually asked him about all of the explosions because <laughs> his rockets keep coming back down. And he kind of just says like, yeah, I mean, it's in a way it's, he doesn't directly say this, but he kind of implies that it's a good thing when they wreck because they get to learn a lot. And that's the yeah. point of the test missions is to learn. Not that his are manned and people aren't dying. So it's it's not really the same thing. But it kind of reminds me of that sort of sen sentiment. Yeah. And it's good to note here that unlike some of our other episodes of our podcast, this one is a little bit happier. This is about the only <laughs> sad part in the podcast. So had to include the one unfortunate part of the Apollo program, but for the most part, this is a pretty good success story, this episode, and we'll be a lot happier as this episode goes on. You mean Buzz Aldrin didn't en didn't enslave his crewmates? I wasn't going to mention the S word in this episode. <laughs> Some of the other notable me. Apollo missions included Apollo 7, which was the first publicly broadcasted takeoff of a crewed mission, which or and this mission orbited Earth. Apollo 8 was the first crewed flight of using the Saturn V launch vehicle, and they ended up orbiting the moon 10 times within 20 hours. Apollo mm. 10 was considered a dress rehearsal, so to say, for the lunar landing, and they actually flew the lunar module to within 50,000 feet of the moon's surface before returning and heading back to Earth. And because of the success of the previous few Apollo missions, they determined that Apollo 11 would be the actual mission to attempt the moon landing hmm. so apollo 11 took place they launched on july 16th 1969 and it was in effect the first crewed lunar landing where they spent two hours and 31 minutes on the surface of the moon and collected a 47 and a half pounds of moon samples and rocks and things that they could bring back to study which was the purpose yeah. of going there other than just for achieving the feat of landing on the moon the crew aboard Apollo 11 included Commander Neil Armstrong, Lunar Module Pilot Buzz Aldrin, and Command Module Pilot Michael Collins. The actual flight... I don't know why. I Sorry to interrupt. But I, I don't know why I figured they were on the moon a lot shorter time than that. I don't like. I would have assumed it was like a half an hour and then they had to split. Well, it wasn't necessarily all at once. They would go down in the Lunar Module and they were actually away from the CSM for about a full day oh wow but they couldn't actually be out on the surface of the moon the entire time there's obviously time in getting down to the surface getting back up to the csm and yeah. just needing to adjust to different atmospheric conditions but actually being out on the surface of the moon in total was about two and a half hours wow okay their flight plan was pretty straightforward they would use saturn 5 to launch them into earth's atmosphere they would orbit Earth once or twice to verify that they were ready, and then Saturn V would propel them toward the moon. Once they approached the moon, the CSM would detach from the launch vehicle to expose the lunar module. The CSM would then rotate 180 degrees, dock with the lunar module, and detach from the launch vehicle and begin its two, two to three day journey toward the moon. So in space this happened. Yes. Like yep. the, the spacecraft detached and turned around. And yep. <laughs> Take some very skilled 60s. piloting. 
That's crazy. Once they approach the moon, the CSM passes behind the moon and reaches a steady lunar orbit. The commander and the lunar module pilot enter the lunar module and deploy its landing gear. Then the lunar module detaches from the CSM and begins its descent. The lunar module makes a vertical landing on the moon where the commander and the lunar module pilot can begin their extra vehicle activities, which are called EVAs. These are just spacewalks or when they're actually outside collecting these samples and anything that they're tasked to do when they're actually, you know, outside of a space vehicle. (laughs) And it was at this moment on July 20th, 1969, that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin fulfilled JFK's promise to land a man on the moon before the end of the 1960s. Sort of just in the nick of time, too. I mean, right. with six months to go. But they got it done. So we'll take a short break here, now that we kind of talked about Apollo 11, and we're going to get yeah. in to tell the story of the one person on this crew who did not walk on the moon, Michael Collins. Poor Michael Collins. We'll be right back. So today we're talking about the Apollo 11 space mission, which was, as we said, the first mission to land a man on the moon. And I'm sure you were familiar with the Apollo 11 mission before we started tonight's episode. Yeah. Would you have been able to name all three astronauts before we got into it? Probably not. I, I mean, honestly, I wouldn't have been able to name our topic for today. I, I knew the other two for sure. Everyone pretty much knows Neil Armstrong because he's famous for his yeah. one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind quote that we hear so much when we talk about this mission. And even right. Buzz Aldrin is pretty well known as just being the second man to walk on the moon and accompanied Armstrong on this mission. But I would be willing to bet that in the 50 years since this took place, the third member of the crew, Michael Collins, has sort of fallen out of recognition, at least more so than the other two. Probably yeah. the average American couldn't name the third member of the crew. So I thought he was a perfect candidate for history's B-side. And yeah. we're going to talk about his background a little bit on this episode and what he went through going through this mission. Michael Collins was born on October 31st in 1930 in Rome, Italy. He's an American citizen, Hmm. but he was born in Rome because he was, as we call, an army brat. His father was uh, Major General James Lawton Collins. He served in both world wars for the U.S. Army. And Michael and his three older siblings, they lived all over the U.S. and Puerto Rico, really just depending on where his father was currently stationed. Eventually, the family settled down in Washington, D.C., where he attended St. Albans School and Upon graduation, he decided to follow in his father's and older brother's footsteps in attending the military academy at West Point. Collins was always curious about aeronautics, so he opted to join the not-quite-established-but-coming-soon United States Air Force Academy. He also wanted to avoid claims of nepotism should he join the Army, because his father was already a major general, his brother was a colonel, and his uncle was actually a general and the chief of staff for the U.S. Army. (laughs) It's a military so family. family. Yeah. After choosing to join the Air Force, he started to go through some different training. He became a skilled pilot while training at different Air Force bases and accumulated over 1,500 flying hours as part of a mobile training detachment, which allowed him to qualify for an Air Force Experimental Flight Test Pilot School in 1960. Was that specifically, I mean, was that designed to train astronauts? Uh, what is exp- I guess what a better question to ask is what does experimental flight mean? It more had to do with testing out different weapons and military grade okay. aircrafts. They actually did pull a lot of astronauts from this program, but it wasn't specifically astronaut training. Gotcha. Okay. But it was while he was in this experimental flight test school that he became inspired to pursue becoming an astronaut, especially when he witnessed the first American orbital space flight called Mercury Atlas 6, which was piloted by John Glenn and orbited the Earth three times in under five hours. Initially, he failed to be accepted into NASA's second astronaut group, but he was accepted into the third group of astronauts in October of 1963. Turned out to be good timing, I guess, huh? Yeah, seriously. And he said that in multiple interviews post all this in modern days, he said that he kind of just was in the right place at the right time. Yeah. 
All three of them. He said that about his crewmates as well. Once he completed his spaceflight basic training, Collins was assigned his specializations, pressure suits, and EVAs, which we mentioned were those extravehicular activities. His first assignments came as a part of Project Gemini, which was NASA's second human spaceflight program. He served as the backup pilot for Gemini 7, and on these space crews we should mention that they have what's called a backup crew and a prime crew. The prime crew is the ones who are okay. actually participating in the mission, go actually into space and pilot and crew the spacecrafts. But they always had a backup crew that would train along with the prime crew pretty much up until launch day. They would start to back off a little bit towards the end once it seemed that everything was going smoothly. But the backup crew had to gotcha. be prepared just in case anything happened to any of the prime crew. If they needed to drop out sure. for medical reasons or whatever else, the backup crew was ready to go, ready to serve on the missions pretty much up until launch day. His first actual space flight came when he was the pilot or the prime pilot on Gemini 10. The purpose of this mission was to rendezvous and dock with two Agena target vehicles. I'm not familiar with that name. Were these like space stations or other spaceships that we launched? The Agena target vehicles, or just ATVs as they were called, were these uncrewed spacecraft that they actually just used to practice these rendezvous and docking procedures. Oh, We should explain that rendezvous are essentially just... It's a, it's a technical term for when these spacecrafts that they were actually boarding would essentially just float through space pretty much unpiloted yeah. and this is basically what the lunar module did so they was preparing them to eventually use the lunar module to get from the csm down to the surface the of the moon surface. and then be able to get back up to the csm to return back to earth okay. and docking pretty self-explanatory it's just when they use these extra spacecrafts to attach to their main flight craft gotcha Basically, exactly what the lunar module would do. It would dock with the CSM and then rendezvous down to the surface of the moon, rendezvous back up, and dock with the CSM. Gotcha. So he was practicing these with these ATVs and actually repairing some of them on the purpose of this mission. He had to make two of these extravehicular activities, 49 minutes and 39 minutes respectively, which made him the first person to take two spacewalks in one single mission. Shortly after the success of Gemini 10, Collins was reassigned to work in the Apollo program. Originally, he was going to be the backup command module pilot for Apollo 2, but the mission was inevitably canceled. Because of this, he was reassigned to be on the prime crew for Apollo 8, but was removed from that program after experiencing some serious medical issues in his legs. He went through some surgery and recovery, but was again assigned to be the command module pilot for Apollo 11, along with Neil Armstrong as commander and Buzz Aldrin as the lunar module pilot. So all of this kind of worked one way or another to eventually yeah. seal his destiny to be a part of this historic crew on Apollo 11. Right. All the cars just kind of fell into place. Right. So following the success of Apollos 9 and 10, which they really used to test the lunar module, it was determined that Apollo 11 would be the lunar landing mission. For this mission, the CSM was given the call name Columbia, and the lunar module was called Eagle. And we'll use those terms, because we're talking specifically about this mission, we'll use those terms for the rest of the yeah. episode. Okay. As the command module pilot, Collins would not be boarding the lunar module or participating in any EVAs on this mission. So his training was very different than what Aldrin and Armstrong were going through. A lot of times he would train on his own while the two of them would be working on lunar module tests or practices. He was kind of working in his head for every little detail about his own missions. His job was going to be to orchestrate the rendezvous with the lunar module and ensure the safe departure and return of his crewmates. In order to prepare for this, he compiled a 117 page book of all different scenarios in which the situation could go horribly wrong <laughs> and how he would have to react to them. Jeez. Honestly, that just seems to me like a very well-organized anxiety attack. I'm just thinking of every way something could go wrong. I'm sure it is, but it's also kind of what you have to do. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. They're doing something that's I'd rather have never been done before. <laughs> and it's better to be overprepared than stranded on the moon. That's fair. <laughs> so this mission would follow pretty much according to plan. Saturn V launched Columbia toward the moon as Collins would successfully dock with the lunar module and approach a steady lunar orbit. 
Once they were there, Armstrong and Aldrin boarded Eagle and began their descent, landing safely on the moon and stepping into the history books forever. Meanwhile, Collins remained aboard Columbia, orbiting the moon by himself. Oh man, poor buddy. I feel bad for him. He's just chilling in the module alone. This is where his story gets kind of, I don't know, scary seems like a good word, but also it's an experience that only Michael Collins has experienced. And well, up to this point, at least. And none of us can really comprehend what might have been going through his mind. The fate of the two moonwalking astronauts rested in the hands of the one person who never set foot on the moon. Despite all the tests and preparatory missions that they went through, there were so many ways that this mission could have gone wrong. The lunar module was never actually tested on the surface of the moon. Its engines could have failed to launch, they could have lost communications permanently, or any small error or mistake in navigation or their time planning could have altered the docking process. If any one of these things went wrong, Armstrong and Aldrin would have been stranded on the moon where Columbia could not reach it and oxygen supplies would inevitably run short. So essentially they would die. Yes. <laughs> I mean, there was not a lot there there's not a lot of like contingency plans when you've only got one lunar module. <laughs> right. And if anything would have gone wrong, Collins would have been forced to leave his crewmates behind and pilot Columbia back to Earth by himself. Wow. In a note that he wrote shortly before the mission, Collins said, My secret terror for the last six months has been leaving them on the moon and returning to Earth alone. Now I am within minutes of finding out the truth of the matter. If they fail to rise from the surface or crash back into it, I am not going to commit suicide. I am coming home. Jeez. But I will be a marked man for life, and I know it. Wow. Some intense stuff. <laughs> it can you imagine the psychological stress he would have had to go through in preparing for this mission? I mean, I get the hundred and seventeen page book of bad scenarios now. <laughs> exactly. I mean, he's trained with these guys from pretty much the moment that they all entered this astronaut program, and now it's yeah. on him to make sure that these guys return home safely as the heroes that they would be honored to be. With like a hundred things that could go wrong and cause that to not happen. Right. And he's the only one there to prevent that. To make sure things go smoothly. The computer apparently dumber than a modern computer. Right. (laughs) As Eagle began its descent, rotating in front of Columbia, Collins tried to inspect it to ensure that it had no damage and the landing gear was properly deployed. As they drifted away towards the moon, Collins radioed to his crewmates saying, Keep talking to me, guys to ensure that they were safe. Collins spent nearly 28 hours alone aboard Columbia as it continuously orbited the moon, and he lost communications for about 48 minutes on each orbit as he drifted around the far side of the moon. Do you know how how long one orbit takes? Took then, I guess? It varied with the different equipment and everything so each mission was a little bit different on apollo 11 i think i read that it took about 119 minutes so about two hours to make an orbit around the moon wow okay and in total so i mean for almost half of that he was by like alone with no knowledge of what was going on on the surface of the moon yeah for no ability to communicate (laughs) with anybody 48 minutes out of every two hours for just over a day collins was completely by himself alone Separated from the rest of humanity by 239,000 miles of space. He was out of sight and out of contact. That's terrifying. I'm scared. I'm not even there and I'm scared. (laughs) Do you like being alone, Matt? I don't mind being alone in my room, but like... Knowing that there's someone you could could just pick up your phone and talk to someone at any time. Right, like I don't even like driving in a, a desert like 30 or 40 i don't know an hour from the nearest town like that gives me the heebie-jeebies so it's i mean even then you can probably walk to civilization again this guy's in a place where like (laughs) nope (laughs) it's hard to imagine and kind of hard to fathom i guess and if you think about it 28 hours isn't that long but 
It's a long time to be. It's a by long yourself time in when space. there's no nothing else really. There's no other option, no way out of it. And sure, he had things to do aboard the command module, just yeah. typical housekeeping duties and checking all the equipment and everything. But he's alone. He's further away from home than any other human has ever experienced alone. Half the time without any sort of communications, not knowing what's going on on the moon, not knowing what's going on with the rest of his crew. Well, that's the other thing I was going to say. It's like that's 28 hours. 28 hours isn't a long time unless uh, you're performing a mission you've been worrying about for six months in which two of your closest coworkers could die. Right. And then you <laughs> like, have a long couple days trip home. Oh, man. Rather than loneliness, though, Collins described this experience as feelings of awareness, anticipation, satisfaction, confidence, almost exaltation. Jesus. On the other note, he had been preparing for this mission for six months. He yeah. was an expert, one of the best pilots in the world, especially one of the best pilots of a spacecraft in the world, and knew what he was doing. His sole focus was on this mission and making sure it was completed yeah. and getting these guys home safely. This is the kind of backstory that you don't hear about when you think about the moon landing. No. I mean, I think this is almost in a way more interesting than actually being on the moon. Right. Uh, for the sole purpose that they had, they were with each other. Like, they had two people with them. What Aldrin and Armstrong did was certainly notable and will forever be in the history books. But their achievement sort of isn't remembered. Well, that's not the right way to say it. Their achievement isn't as noticeable if they don't make it home. Right. That was only the first half of JFK's goal was landing men on the moon. The second half of that quote was getting them home safely. They have to come home. <laughs> right. And all of that fell squarely on Collins' shoulders. The mission continues, though. Collins finishes his orbit and approaches the reconnecting site. Armstrong and Aldrin reboarded Eagle, which lifts off using its descent stage as a launching pad. Eagle docks with Columbia, where Armstrong and Aldrin re-enter the command module with their material samples. Eagle is then jettisoned to eventually crash back onto the moon's surface. The service module engine fires the CSM back toward Earth and is eventually discarded just before re-entry. The command module re-enters Earth's atmosphere, where aerodynamic heating surrounds it with an envelope of ionized air, causing a communications blackout for several minutes. Then the parachutes are deployed, and the command module splashes down into the Pacific Ocean, where the astronauts are then recovered by an aircraft carrier. Can you imagine the sense of, like, relief? Not just, like, first of all, when they finally made it back to the Columbia... Like when he finally got them back in the main ship and they were all together again. But then also when it finally touched down. What's funny like, is one of, the, one of the articles I read, you mentioned a sense of relief when they get back into Columbia. One of the articles I read was a quote from him where he talked about not so much being relieved to see them, but just annoyed that they were covered in moon dirt and that they were bringing it into the <laughs> command module. And like he just had built this that's mom status right there <laughs> this living space that it was his baby this ship was where he spent the entire trip and this this very historic achievement and they filthed it up with all their moon dirt and everything that was on their suits and on, <laughs> and everything they, they looked like back. they had just wrestled <laughs> but i'm sure there was relief in just knowing that they he had accomplished this part of the mission obviously they still needed to make the yeah. journey back home but just knowing that they were back on the ship and that stage of their mission was accomplished. And then the entire journey back, it's two to three days of flying back towards Earth. Re-entering Earth's atmosphere has to be a scary moment to go through. Even the splashdown, sure. <laughs> sure, you're relieved that you're back in Earth's atmosphere, but there's a lot that could go wrong you're there. still in the middle of the ocean. I'm not sure that I'm like fully comfortable until I'm like back on solid ground after <laughs> getting picked up by the... Right. Which is th just think about that, like the last part of their journey where they're already back on Earth and just waiting to get picked up in the ocean would terrify to death most people. Right. Like, I don't want to be floating on a tin can in the middle of the Pacific Ocean <laughs> waiting for somebody to come pick me up. Hopefully they find us, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Collins had already decided prior to Apollo 11 that if the mission was successful, it would be his last. 
He had hoped to achieve JFK's goal of landing on the moon within the decade and did not wish to continue exploring the moon once this had been accomplished. He never felt any resentment or anything about not having walked on the moon himself. It was never a long-term goal of his. He didn't feel it was the pinnacle of being an astronaut. Just being a part of this mission and accomplishing the overall goal as a team was what was important to him. Mm -hmm. He's a stand-up guy. This is kind of reminding me of Frank Wills, not to like shit on Frank Wills, but like he's the opposite of yeah. like wanting the attention <laughs> and expecting the the glory. Yeah, I mean, the, upon their return, the three were celebrated. They had ticker tape parades in New York and Chicago. They went on a global tour where they met the Queen of England and visited dozens of countries. Hmm. But as time went on. Armstrong and Aldrin were still celebrated as the first two men to walk on the moon, but Collins just sort of faded into the background. It just wasn't really his style or desire to want to be memorialized sure. as a hero. He wrote in his autobiography that this venture was structured for three men, and I considered my, my third to be as necessary as either of the other two. The three of them were celebrated as heroes for years upon their return, and deservedly so. But Collins himself always said that he never viewed astronauts as heroes. They were assigned a job to do, and they were they were experts and did that job to the best of their ability. And I think that's really how he viewed his role. Maybe that's why he yeah. never felt any resentment or about the fact that he didn't step on the moon. His job was to fly the CSM around the moon for as long as it took, and then eventually pick them back up and return them home safely. He was fulfilling his task, and he did it to the best of his ability, and he did it successfully. Do you get the sense that that had something to do with his military family and upbringing? Because I feel like that that almost seems like a classic military attitude to have. It's like, this is my duty. I did it. I don't want pomp and circumstance. Yeah, I didn't read that anywhere, but that makes sense. I mean, I think that's a... Sure, I mean, common, I'm just speculating. Right, right. I think that's a common feeling among people with that background is just that you do yeah. your job. You do what you're instructed to do. And that's it. You don't need to be celebrated for doing your job. <laughs> Even though what they did was notable and historic and the first ones in history to do it. Right. But he just did his job and that's all he expected to do. Following his astronaut career, he served as the Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs under President Nixon and as the Director of National Air and Space Museum in the Smithsonian Institute. I suppose that's fitting. <laughs> he actually... Wasn't a fan of the job, uh, Secretary of State for Public <laughs> Affairs, pretty unsurprisingly. But he asked to leave the position and then went, took over as the director of National Air and Space Museum. Among many awards, Collins and the crew were presented with the Presidential Medal of Freedom by Nixon when they returned in 1969. Years later, he was awarded the Congressional Gold Medal in 2011. Michael Collins is still alive today. He's 90 years old. He's the second, second B-sider to still be alive, I That's think. true, two in a row. He's written several books about his space travels, and he, now he pretty much remains out of the spotlight other than some interviews around the anniversaries of the moon landing, occasionally chiming in on different NASA missions like what we're going through right now with the Perseverance rover. Yeah. Do you know if the other two are still alive? This might be a dumb question, but... Buzz Aldrin is still alive. He just turned 91. But Neil Armstrong passed away in 2012. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, it, I guess it's not surprising. Like, when you consider the type of people astronauts usually are, I mean, they're usually either engineers or pilots or scientists or a combination of the above. I mean, I, I feel like in a lot of ways, they they become celebrities, or at least the ones in this mission did. And they're not, like, <laughs> they're not... They didn't want fame. And so I, I guess is I don't know. It, it's not, this behavior isn't out of character. It just seems a bit weird because they're thrust into the spotlight. I think, and obviously we weren't alive for this, but the sense that I got is that Armstrong and Aldrin enjoyed their fame a little bit more. So I think it might just be a personality yeah. thing with Collins. You know, he might sure. relish the fact that he's, a B-sider, so to speak. He probably wouldn't like that we were doing a podcast about him if he knew about us. <laughs> so maybe, <laughs> probably a good thing that he doesn't know that we exist. 
But let's write him. He's obviously important to this mission, and it's notable that his story was told. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for sure. I I think it's it's interesting that so much. I, things that I find more interesting about the mission have to do with him than the other two. Like, right. N- not that any part of the mission isn't interesting cause it's fascinating and, and awesome, but I, I don't know. I find it so much more complex to think about his duties and his position than the other two for some reason. And as terrifying as it would be, I kind of want to experience that solitude. Maybe not for 28 hours when I know that my life is hanging in the balance and I'm responsible for two like other lives. Minutes. But that's not something that you can get on Earth. No. No, no, you can't. Maybe in the most remote places, I don't know, Antarctica. Yeah, I mean, you're still not, you're still not even, I don't know, a quarter of the the distance away from humanity in those places right you know what i mean it's intimidating to think about for sure so are you gonna go up to space when elon musk finally launches his civilian rockets i'm just waiting for him to invent that hyperloop or whatever it was so we can get to cleveland in like 10 minutes (laughs) because the first thing he's gonna do is put the hyperloop between youngstown and cleveland there was supposed to be a stop from like Cleveland and Pittsburgh oh, was there? were on the list with a stop in Youngstown or something like that. I had no knowledge of this. I the might only be one I heard about I've was San heard Francisco to LA. I mean, I think it's definitely in the future. It is a kind of random side note before we get to your quiz questions. Part of that interview with, with Elon, he actually said that they were only a couple of years away from doing that. Now, this is Elon Musk we're talking about, so I don't know how accurate that <laughs> guesstimation is, but to me, it's kind of bonkers that we've got people that are like yeah we're just like two or three years away from sending civilians into space and whatever (laughs) who knows who would have thought in 1969 we'd be putting men on the moon that's true so speaking of the quiz are you ready sure we'll figure it out we'll be right back We just want to take a minute and thank you for listening to History's B-Side. You know, it takes a lot of time to research and put these episodes together, so we wanted to let you know how you can support the show going forward. Go ahead and subscribe at anchor.fm forward slash History's B-Side, or wherever you're listening from. If you'd like, leave us a review and tell us what you think of our show. If you're interested in advertising with the show and hearing your message in a spot like this, send us an email to historiesbside at gmail.com. We're looking forward to hearing from you, and thanks for listening. Okay, welcome back, listeners. We uh, like to end every episode with a short quiz for the host, uh, just to see how much he has learned, and also to give you guys a chance to have some fun and and test your own knowledge of our subjects. Today, I've got a couple questions just kind of surrounding the, the moon landing and our space program in general. The first question is is kind of a throwaway, I think at least, but I don't know that everyone would know it. And there's one specific letter that I had to think about before guessing. So it's supposed to but, be easy? I mean, it's pretty, I think it is, but... Well, don't lead with that because then I'll miss it and then look stupid. <laughs> I said I had to think about it for a while. So the organization that planned and launched the Apollo 11 moon mission is called NASA. Can you tell me what the four letters in NASA stand for? Oh, this is the easy one. National Aeronautics and Space Administration? Yep. I don't know why I had to think about aeronautics for so long. <laughs> <laughs> I was sitting here like, what is it? I thought that was I it. I, you it made me too second easy. guess myself. Well, I'm glad you got it. I, I thought it might be too easy, but I figured I'd ask it anyway. So for the, the second and slightly harder one, We talked a little bit about the space race between the United States and the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union beat us to many different uh, benchmarks in space, um, but two of the more notable ones. (laughs) Two of the more notable benchmarks were the first to launch a satellite 
and the first dog in space. Can you name the satellite and the dog? One point for each. The satellite was called Sputnik, right? Sputnik what? It's a number. Oh, I don't know. Two. It's one. <laughs> it's, just, it's one. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one failed. And the dog. The was dog called... was the dog was launched on Sputnik two. Oh, jeez. Uh, rover six. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly am not sure how to pronounce it. It's N A I K A. Like what? Naika You're giving me a Naika? question that you don't even know how to pronounce the answer. I tried to look it up. I couldn't find a video pronouncing her name, but it's how am I Naika. supposed to get that? I don't know. <laughs> I gave you an easy one for a reason. <laughs> the last one's not any easier. Great. It might be. So for your final question, the crew of Apollo 11 was asked to bring pieces of another historic moment in American flight history. Can you tell me what that moment was and what the pieces were? <laughs> I have no idea, but I'm just going to make a random guess and hope that it's right. I'm going to guess it had something to do with the Wright brothers' flight. So, yep. Something from their bicycle shop, maybe? That's incorrect, but I'll give you the credit. It was pieces of the plane. Okay. I thought that would be too obvious, so I was hoping for <laughs> something a little yeah, more they asked, out there. They asked Buzz Aldrin to take pieces of the plane into space under the agreement that he could keep half of the pieces he was provided. And <laughs> obviously, as a. As a giant flight nerd, he decided to go for it. <laughs> Buzz Aldrin's just collecting souvenirs. Which, those guys definitely kept some space rocks, didn't they? Like, we said they collected, what, 47 I mean, I don't and a half know, pounds feel... of samples? I read they, they definitely to go collected an even 50 pounds. <laughs> you think they had to come through moon Do you have to customs? claim space rocks? <laughs> yeah, do you have to claim space rocks on customs? <laughs> like coffee? No, I think it's uh, duty-free. Oh. Of course. Space rocks are, of course, to be free. I don't know why I didn't think about that. <laughs> Bought it with your liquor and <laughs> Cuban cigars. Yeah. It's in the space rock section. <laughs> All right. So we're going to leave you with 48 minutes of total silence. Thank you for listening to the episode. <laughs> we'll see you next week. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Just kidding. Here's the outro. History's B-Side is an independent, listener-supported podcast. Leave us a review or subscribe to the show on your favorite podcasting service and follow along on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at History's B-Side. Send us your feedback or inquire about sponsorship and advertising opportunities by emailing us at historiesbside at gmail.com. You can support the show by visiting anchor.fm slash historiesbside. This episode was researched and produced by your hosts, Matt Melito and Phil Hall. Thanks for listening to History's B-Side. <laughs>